I thought it was a great set of presentations, and, uh, and I, th I thought it was also particularly rich um, in, in a variety of advice and, and a variety of perspectives, and I, th I think it's worth uh, 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 taking some time to unpack that and, and to get a, a, a kind of view of it from uh, the perspective of an, a number of people who have uh, some significant you know, personal and local experience. Uh, uh, in in these matters related to space, so I'm really glad that Chris Banks, Simon Neem, and Laura Leitanji are here to uh, uh, to serve as uh, reactors. I'm going to turn it over to them, and uh, and and they've agreed that they'll just go in the order in the, that's in the program, and and then I hope we'll be able to have a kind of discussion uh, and bring some questions from the floor. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Um, uh, my name's Chris Banks, and I'm from the University of Aberdeen, and there's some stuff in the um, uh, folders. I think um, a huge amount of what I've heard here today has really resonated with, with me and with the project that I've been um, working on at the University of Aberdeen. And I think you probably may share with me the, the fact that one of the things that we got out of this was, was the passion um, that everybody had about their project, about the process. Um, these projects are fun. Sometimes they're very, very hard, but they are, I think overall, they are an enormous amount of fun, and I think some of that has, has come across um, today. Um, just a teeny bit about my own institution. Um, we, we are a little younger than St Andrews. We are uh, founded in 1495, and we're the fifth oldest in the <laughs> English-speaking world. Um, We've got about 16,000 students. Um, we're in a fairly remote part of, of Scotland. We're actually two and a half hours further north of Edinburgh. Um, and we're on the east coast of Scotland, and we are even further north than St. St. Andrews. Uh, we're in the oil capital of Europe, but it's a relatively small city. There are about 240,000 people in the city. Um, the university occupies, uh, is in a, a sort of ancient part of the just outside, now lies just outside the city, but its immediate university neighbours include some of the most deprived in Scotland. Now, our own um, £57 million Library and Special Collection Centre opened last autumn. It includes a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about here, cafe, gallery, public space, education spaces, conservation centre, spaces to allow um, academics and students to engage with our special collections. Um, and it actually started, the project started with an academic proposal for a humanities research centre. And that proposal grew all sorts of arms and legs. Um, the librarians up to that point already knew that a new facility was desperately needed, but um, I think it was really only the point within the university where the academics made the case, um, and, and that suddenly sort of whipped up a wonderful fervor, further, um, not least with our then university principal, um, uh, who was a historian and um, absolutely ran with the project and came up with this fantastic vision for an iconic building. Um, in this relatively small place called uh, Aberdeen. Um, our own project started um, slightly differently from, from the way that some of the projects here have been talked about, particularly with the architects talking. Um, our strategic brief was based on what we currently had uh, with the addition of some space for collection growth and, and for increased student numbers. And so one of the key things as we've been developing the project has actually been to, um, to look around, not, not at what we had, but actually what, what we might have, what others were doing. And of course, um, the, the project itself was being developed at a time of enormous technological change. So probably one of the other things that I'd factor into the mix if we have a, you know, further discussion about this is the whole need for you know, actually changing the building as you are building or as you're working through the final stages of the plans and the projects. Um, we, we were incredibly fortunate. We had um, a, an international um, a competition to launch for our architects uh, and the guys that won it, if any of you know Copenhagen and the Black Diamond, uh, Schmidt, Hammer, Larsen are those architects and they are the architects for our library. Um, that brings with itself interesting challenges when you have a signature architect with a very um, distinctive view about library spaces and in particular for us it is a wonderfully airy building I, we haven't got the slides up anymore but if, you've, if you were looking earlier you may have seen this building which had a lot of sort of swirl um, and atrium in it so ours has a, a, a fabulous gorgeous 
um, space up through the middle of it, which brings interesting challenges when you're actually then thinking about noise control and space layout. Um, um, but what it does do is bring wonderful light into the building from absolutely every, every angle. But as, again, one of the things that was talked about here, um, the project is not an end in itself. It's the beginning of what, what you can actually deliver. And one of the key things for our project was not only delivering state-of-the-art um, research and study space, but also opening up our collections to, to a much wider audience. Um, you imagine with an institution that's been in existence for over 500 years and has been collecting for all of that time that we, we actually have some, some wonderful items in, in amongst our collections, but they were relatively little known. And so um, one of the key parts of that has actually been the opening up of those collections and creating of a gallery space that allows us to safely and securely do that process review and that's something that hasn't really I haven't really picked up in in some of the speakers but for us process review was actually an integral part and in 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 the end informed some of the interior layout of the of the building looking at just simple things like acquisition uh, book acquisition or and printed material acquisition and where it's destined um, I've probably saved thousands of lift miles and book miles by um, completely relocating well first of all co-locating our cataloging and acquisitions team and then relocating them so that they are on the same floor as the as the space where about 90 percent of what they do actually gets delivered I mentioned the sort of rapid technology change and, and how that needed to be factored in as we actually worked through the design and the construction of, of the building. Um, we took the opportunity to do a lot of automation, including um, putting in a book sorting machine, and that's allowed us to free up staff time to deliver um, some of the frontline services and really to deliver the value. Um, for my role, I also had to do a huge amount of fundraising. We um, and Special Collections came up yesterday as a sort of key part of that, and I'm afraid we shamelessly exploited ours. Um, but we have managed to raise over 19 million pounds for the con for the construction and also for the ongoing project delivery of of uh, some of the public facing projects on the back of our special collections. Um, so they have been an, and continue to be an enormous asset to to us and the university. Um, our students could have been forgiven for thinking last September that they'd actually re returned to the wrong university because not only had they got, got a new library building, we'd introduced a completely new resource discovery layer which had enabled us to wrap up um, our book, our journal, our archive, our museum, our rare book stock, our web resources, our digital resources, all into a single discovery layer. Um, we'd also changed all the web pages and given them a complete overhaul, and just for good measure, we'd introduced a new virtual learning environment. Um, but actually, it's all worked wonderfully well. Um, the whole sort of integrated process has worked really well. Just a few outcomes um, which we might sort of debate. Um, one of the things we, in the end, did, did, because we couldn't afford the big, big building that our architects wanted to build, is that we actually only took 50% of our book stock into the new building. Interestingly, because we used a lot of data to decide what those 50% should be, um, we've actually seen increased use of book stock. Um, the resource discovery has, has it resulted in, the resource discovery layer has resulted in increased use across the board. We've seen a 70% increase in visitor with a 105% increase in occupancy, and I think that was something you were seeing, um, the fact that they come and they stay longer. Um, for us in the first six months, we've seen over a half a million visits, um, including 30,000 external visits from people just coming to see the buildings, coming to see the gallery, coming to participate in some of our external programs. Um, we're now attracting visitors to the city. Indeed, there are some here, Merrily, um, and Jackie have both been, so ask them what they think about the building more than me. Um, but there's actually a serious economic impact to having built an attractive place in the city. Normally, if you live in Aberdeen, you have to travel everywhere for conferences. People don't come to you. But now they're actually wanting to put on conferences in, in the place. Um, <laughs> And I think my, my, my sort of final point is that um, is, is to really a, a quote which I think uh, probably many librarians would aspire to having a, a quote like this about their building. 
Um, if Apple built libraries, they'd be like this, white and shiny and intuitive. And I have to say, I loved the intuitive word because that, that said that all the planning that we'd done involving all the students, and that, that was, those are really, really good points there about just involving all the stakeholders at every stage of the process. But the fact that people felt when they came into the building that it was intuitive was, was, was quite heartwarming. So a, a sort of variety of, of, of sort of takeaways from... Um, uh, from, from what we've seen there, but a lot of, of similar experiences. Great. My turn. My turn. Right? Uh, so good morning. Uh, my name is Simon Neem, and I'm the um, the director of the Irving K. Barber Learning Center at UBC. It's a pleasure to be here, and I thank uh, all the presenters for their great um, uh, presentations. Part of my reaction uh, uh, today, I thought, should just say ditto, uh, because <laughs> yeah. uh, they've, they've really raised, I think, some really key and essential uh, points. Um, my perspective uh, that I bring today is sort of a little bit um, after uh, the stage that uh, Shauna, um, uh, Chris, and, um, and then before you, I think, uh, in that we had the opportunity, I had the pleasure of working on a, a major building project at the University of BC. Uh, to revamp the uh, what was then called the old uh, or what was then the old main library called the main library, and uh, into something that was uh, at the time uh, uh, quite a visionary idea of creating this uh, what was then the learning center, the university learning center, and then uh, thanks to a donation uh, from Mr. Uh, Irving K. Barber, became the Irving K. Barber Learning Center. The, the idea uh, and, the, and the vision for this space was to revision a, a, a library for the 21st century and to uh, make it both a library but more broadly uh, the center for learning on campus. And um, I know some of you in this room have, have been there and have spent some time at the Learning Center at various conferences and Lorelai was just there a week ago. Uh, so please do ask uh, others what, what they think of the spaces. Um, I'd just like to make a few points uh, as I was thinking, as I was hearing the presentations. One of them, um, for me, has been it's been really interesting to think about space and how um, library, uh, library space becomes an incredible opportunity for us uh, in this era of digital collections and digital services and, and other initiatives. Um, space becomes, I think, a, a real opportunity for us to let go of some of our traditional um, uh, types of spaces that we create and services and to build in the things like uh, Shauna showed you pictures of and, and it's uh, in many, many new libraries that I visited and of course is, is in our library as well. Um, now I say that, uh, but then I'm also going to say uh, right in the same sentence that one of the big learning uh, outcomes for me being involved in this project was to also um, not be too hasty to get rid of the kind of spaces that libraries have um, traditionally provided. And so I, I've been really delighted uh, at how students have reacted to some of the spaces in our building, like uh, we recreated a reading room that we had to demolish uh, as part of our um, uh, removing most of the original, or most of the building except for the original heritage core, but included quite a lovely uh, reading room that was uh, built as part of the, in a 1960s renovation. Um, we added, uh, re-added that space in and, and made it very library-like, uh, uh, double height ceilings, uh, floor-to-ceiling windows, mezzanine, um, comfortable chairs, long oak reading tables, and of course, portraits of past presidents and chancellors <laughs> from our 100 years of being a university, um, which is a big on the West Coast. But, uh, but you know, the students uh, absolutely uh, love it. it. It's one of their favorite spaces. They tell, they tell us it's academic, they tell us it has history, and it's a kind of space they feel like they want to seek out when they do come to university. And um, the, you know, and, and other spaces that we, in our heritage core, we have a very grand, what used to be an old, uh, the old reading room, and we kind of uh, turned into a, a learning common. So we added the technology, but kept all of the traditional spaces. And that, of course, is our obligatory Harry Potter room uh, in the building. But again, um, incredible, um, uh, you know, students have just adopted that space. They feel very passionate about an, an ownership of that space. So to me, the, the big takeaway was that, um, yes, 
we have the collaborative spaces, the huge open uh, flexible spaces, everything is on wheels. Thank you for mentioning the casters mm -hmm. and not tearing up the uh, uh, carpet because that's a big lesson to save you some money. Um, everything does move in those spaces. Sometimes it moves between floors. Sometimes it moves from <laughs> one end of the building to the other. Uh, but the, the point is I think that those uh, what we're now building are spaces for so many different styles of learning and, and approaches to learning. And uh, any one person will need, uh, at different times, both quiet, self-reflective space, as well as group space and noisy cafe space and all of that. So we try uh, as, as much as we can to meet as many of those needs as we can. And it's all appreciated by students. The other point I wanted to raise, um, and I, I've been really uh, pleased about the, the service element that was um, from our key, kicked off with our keynote uh, yesterday and has continued on uh, in a theme because um, I sometimes look at these spaces and think, well, we, we're not even, we don't even have the name library in the title of our building, uh, which is sort of a bit controversial um, uh, with some of the folks uh, in the library at the time. But um, interestingly enough, uh, the students I hear uh, most often still refer to it as they're in the library. In fact, they call it the Barber Library, not the Barber Learning Center, which is totally fine. I just think that's really interesting that we have very few physical collections in the building um, overall as a total percentage of our space, but students still see it as, as, a, um, as, a, as a library space. And I really think this is for our campus and, and for the Barber Center, our opportunity as a library to really showcase how libraries are at the center of learning and really support learning. And that's kind of one of the themes we've really made uh, with our building. We have other libraries on campus. We're looking at um, our Humanities and Social Sciences Library, which is a beautiful building. It was planned and opened uh, and, and, and finally opened in 1997, so right on the cusp of that major change. So of course, it was, it was uh, completely out of date the day it opened, and the two buildings face each other, and people have said it's really interesting, the contrast between the two very shiny glass gleaming buildings, and one is completely out of date and the other is, is, is as flexible and as current as we can make it. So we're trying to look at that other building now and, and maybe build in uh, a theme and a, a bit of a, a research focus there. So I did want to echo that, that service element and the fact that I think our spaces are wonderful opportunities to cluster services. I know that's something that's been mentioned a few times. Um, my background uh, in libraries has been around program development and service development, and um, I'm fortunate with the Barber Center because of the way our funding's arranged to actually um, uh, have my own budget, a little bit separate from the main university library uh, budget. And I often um, tell my colleagues around the management table uh, in the library that um, I have, uh, you know, like everyone, a lot of pressures on the budget. And I, I take a portion of my budget, it's, it's for core programs, and I tell them that's my collection budget. Uh, I don't buy books, I don't buy materials uh, for the Barber Center, but what I do is I create programs. And my, collection, my, my program budget, to me, is as precious as, as the main library's collection budget, because without that program budget, to me, the building is empty. It's, it's nice space, it's, it's beautiful, um, it's well used, but it, it, to me, it, it lacks that heart and soul unless the programs and the services are present. So I'm as fiercely protective of my program budget as, as my colleagues uh, are um, of their uh, collection budget. And I think it makes a nice statement around that um, balance between how important our programs and services are. Um, I guess the, uh, uh, lots of points, um, I'm gonna just um, stop in a second. I did wanna, uh, did wanna mention a couple more things um, about the, um, if you do uh, build the right space, they definitely will come. Like Shauna, we're dealing with uh, uh, gate counts or door counts. We have 12 entrances to the building, uh, but our collections are contained in one zone. So thank you, Sarah, for mentioning the zone uh, model because that's been extremely useful for us. We do open the building 24 seven at different times. Uh, and we do have very long building opening hours because we do have our collections contained in one area that we can section off, which has been really useful. Um, they do come uh, at a count of about 250,000 a month uh, during the term. Um, so the furniture that they tell you lasts for three years or five years <laughs> lasts for like half that time if you're lucky. So uh, a lot of challenges with being overly successful around space. And can, I was just telling uh, folks at our table, really keeping that theme um, uh, what, 
what I have decided and what we've decided with the Barber Centre, that theme around learning, really keeping it front and centre. So I, I have said no to everyone from uh, colleagues all the way up to the President's office who wants to just do something because the space is nice. Okay, I've said yes to the President a couple of times. Because they actually <laughs> coughed up more than half the budget. But, but we have really, and actually for the first couple of years it was tough. Now it's quite easy. People actually now know that when we do clear out student space or, or use space in the building for events, it has to have a, a learning theme. It, it often has to be open either to community or to students. And we've really tried to make that a core mandate so that the space then becomes uh, very programmed in a sense just by the space itself. Even if you aren't delivering programs at that particular moment, there's a sense that this is a place of learning. And the students have really respected that. So, so I think that's an important sort of subtle theme to keep there. And the last thing I'll mention, um, and I haven't, we haven't really talked about uh, so much, but I put this out to the group. Um, the thing I struggle with is how do we measure the, the wonderful um, uh, impact of what these spaces are that we're creating. I, I've got these fancy uh, statistics now that we have our door counting system on and working. Uh, so I can say, yeah, we do, you know, we're the busiest building on campus, we're the center of campus, students love us. We have all of that evidence. Um, but how is this uh, impacting student success uh, and learning? And, and again, our building is quite focused on, on student engagement. We also have quite a strong community engagement mandate. So we've been also doing a lot of programming for community. But for the student sort of learning and success side, I'm still struggling with, with I can tell great stories, but I'm having trouble tracking what this means, you know, after students have engaged uh, service clusters in the learning commons and all of that stuff has been great. But I'm, I'm still struggling, and I know a number of my colleagues are around. So what's the impact? How can we tell the story of how that helps the students right through their, their studies at, at the university? So I'll just leave that out there for maybe some thoughts and comments from the group. Turn it over to you, Lorelai. OK, thank you. I'm Laura Tanji, and I'm from the University of California in Irvine, which is approximately halfway between Los Angeles and San Diego. And, and we're not 100 years old. In fact, uh, in 2015, we'll be 50. So I, I'm, I present a contrast here. Um, the other thing that I can present as a contrast is that in terms of developing space in ways that support partnerships with campus units, we're just at the beginning of our story. So I've really appreciated hearing the speakers and the panelists talk because I find that it is incredibly inspirational to hear about these success stories. What we're planning to do, and we're right in the middle of doing construction and renovation, is going to be sharing our spaces with two different units. One is a writing center, which has been a vision for nine years and is finally coming to fruition on our campus, which is supposed to consolidate the writing efforts for students, faculty, TAs, instructors, and it's going to be run by our Division of Undergraduate Education. And this is really going to support teaching, but in addition, there's going to be a component for research, too. What they hope to do is to bring faculty there to do research about writing. And as the UCI libraries, we've already been doing a lot of collaborations with our Division of Undergraduate Education, but I think here we're really excited by the possibilities of increased collaborations and the synergy between the Writing Center and the libraries being right in our Ayala Science Library. Uh, the other uh, unit that uh, we're going to be sharing spaces is our campus information technology, our office of, inf of information technology. And they're rather big, and so the people that will be moving into our Ayala library are programmers. And they do a lot of consultation with faculty about programming. And we're actually, we haven't taken advantage of that, but with the geographic proximity of having them there, uh, we're looking forward to uh, partnerships with them too. Uh, there is a third unit that we've shared spaces with in our Gateway Study Center, and that's a unit called Student Outreach and Retention, or SOAR. And as you might imagine, these are areas where we have shared goals in helping to support and provide services uh, for student success. But I'm going to switch over to reacting to the speakers, and also actually the panelists, too. Um, 
I hope that one of the questions um, and comments that will come up in the Q&A session might be about how we use social media to market our library spaces. I think there's actually two parts to this. I know a lot of libraries have created a presence, either you know in, free, in, in Facebook or on Flickr or YouTube. But the other part is how our students are reacting to the spaces, how they are commenting about this in Yelp, they're talking about our libraries out there. They're, they're mentioning us in Foursquare. What about Pinterest, where they're pinning images of our libraries into their own little uh, uh, boards, if you will? And we've heard the term Gen X and millennials, but in business, they also use a term called verge culture, V-E-R-G-E, -E, or the verge generation, which is the first generation to grow up into the internet. And what they do is, of course, they're very tech savvy and connect connected and innovative, and they love to share their opinions about everything, music, fashion, libraries, <laughs> the best place to study. And the other thing that they're doing is they're actually creating apps that help us out. So I was talking to one of my colleagues, Tom Leonard, who's the university librarian at uh, Berkeley, and he mentioned how a UCB student had created an app that's available on iTunes. And what this uh, app does is it, it, it covers a whole range of services for students, their bookstore, campus events, but it also has a gym status monitor to tell the students when the treadmills are free. And they have a library status monitor, which gives up to the minute information about how full the library is and whether they can find a seat to study. So I hope that people in the audience and maybe also on the panel and the speakers will share with us some of the ways that the students are actually responding back and engaging with our new spaces and our new services. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, I'd also uh, want to comment about the uh, speakers talking about how they're reinventing the library and changing around their spaces. Um, I'm getting a sense that, in general, everybody is very positive about the changes that are occurring. But I'm sure that some of you are getting comments about, um, I think Andrea mentioned, uh, sometimes uh, people like routine that they may be getting comments about, well, why are you doing all of these changes? And we were comfortable with the way things were. So I'm hoping people will change how they're grappling with those questions and concerns. Um, I stumbled across a concept that I think might help some of you, and that concept is called defamiliarization. And this is a, a, a concept that was coined by a, a man named Victor Shklovsky, so for those of you who are tweeting, that's spelled S-H-K-L-O-V-S-K-Y. And, and in a nutshell, what this is about, is about making the familiar strange or making the strange familiar. And it started off really with Russian formalist criticism, but it got picked up by art and architecture. So when you think about art and you think about Dada and postmodern uh, post art, um, it's very familiar and yet it's unfamiliar. And in architecture, the way it gets picked up is that they defamiliarize things so that you see new things. And that by creating a sense of unease, you actually heighten the senses of the way people are perceiving. And that by creating these unfamiliar environments, you help to create new observations new experiences, and promote innovation and stimulate learning, which is what it's all about. So as I was listening to the speakers and also the panelists, I thought, my gosh, you're using defamiliarization techniques, whether you know it or not, to create this reaction here. Um, last of all, um, I was very much struck by Shauna Shauna's description of uh, the Taylor Family Digital Library, the LAMP concept of libraries, museums, archives, and press. I know that there are uh, several uh, members in the audience who are from museums. And uh, just as libraries are grappling uh, with 
changes in their space and trying to rethink things and, and their services. Museums are doing the same thing. I think there's a lot of parallels between the way that we're looking at our spaces as public areas for education, learning, and culture. And we both have aspirations for keeping things open, accessible, and really promoting that community engagement. And I think that we can learn from each other. So one of the approaches that I see being discussed and being explored very successfully in the art and museum world is the concept of relational aesthetics or relational art. Mm -hmm. Now, relational aesthetics was first proposed by Nicholas Borio, an art critic. And what it's all about is that um, you, your audience is a community. And the artwork is not an encounter between a viewer and an object. Rather, in relational art, it's all about these intersubjective encounters. So a really good example of this is an artist named Rick Ritt Tiranovit. I'm not going to spell this one. And he is a contemporary Thai artist at Columbia University. And one of his pieces is to make curry. So at the Museum of Modern Art, he offered free Thai vegetarian curry. And what's important here is that the curry wasn't the art. It was the people and bringing them together to eat, to talk, and to interact. That was the art. And so when I think about and hear, heard the speakers talk about how they're bringing together people to interact and to create knowledge, I thought to myself, gosh, they're making curry here. <laughs> And really, I think that by creating these physical and virtual environments where people come together for shared activities of learning or creating knowledge, uh, when you're transforming your spaces, whether it's, it's the uh, speakers, panelists, or, or those of you in the audience, when you transform those spaces, you're actually doing a form of relational art, which I think is an intriguing way to look at this. And the other thing that I tried to do was to do a, a quick literature search. Um, I got zero results between relational aesthetics in libraries or relational art in libraries. And I think that this is a concept that might be worth fleshing out a little bit more. It seems like something could be done with this thought. And so I'm really interested in doing a little bit more. And so if any of you are interested in exploring this topic, uh, get in contact with me after this meeting. It seems as if because of the social aspect of this topic, it's something that should be done as a group rather than as, a, as an individual. And what I'm hoping that people will share in the audience afterwards is how they're using their spaces in this social relational art way. I'm going to pause at this point. I'll start reacting to the <laughs> reactor panel. Um, the first time I encountered Curry in a library uh, is in a marvelous set of libraries that is in the London borough of Hamlet Towers, um, Tower Hamlets, uh, Tower Hamlet, excuse me, the Idea Store. So um, Simon was saying his library is not called a library. This, their libraries are the Idea Store. and. Um, Cooking uh, classes are encouraging the community to cook in their their native uh, in their um, home country foods is one of the things they do. Um, and I also found uh, belly dancing classes and uh, language classes, and uh, I found uh, educational classes leading to a certificate focused on a variety of uh, professional technical fields. Um, and I don't know where this is on the spectrum of functionality and art, especially um, relational art, but, and I, I can't add too much more on, on um, uh, relational uh, aesthetics at, at this point, but I did want to mention I, that um, it, it caused the pause and caused me to look at things differently, walking into the library and f smelling and, and finding the curry. Um, did you have a... <laughs> Go ahead. I'm I didn't have a curry story. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to. I'll comment one other thing that was brought up about um, coping with change. I think that's very, very important. So one of the things that we find um, 
that this is just a just a huge a huge topic. And so, as we suggested, that if you're making you are making significant changes when you're doing a building project. Start those changes in your current space. Um, if you are ch radically changing the aesthetics in the new new library, start with a part of your library and do that. If you're changing to user-directed services from everything being done by professional librarian staff, start that now so that your staff can settle into it, um, so the public can settle into it, and so you're not going on that journey with and, and having those discussions. Um, and, and also you'll learn from the experience. You'll learn how, you'll learn better ideas from having used that. Um, so I did want to mention um, just that the, the way some of the strategies that we found. In general, it's a very, very real topic. Uh, we do find that the, the library community um, is often very, very conservative at the staff level, and it really needs to be they're a very important stakeholder. And so this idea of, um, of um, instigating the change very early in the process while you're still formulating your ideas and testing it at that level is going to make the ultimate, the final programming space plan and architecture easier. I'll turn it over to you. Oh, I'll just start following up on that follow-up. Um, I think the key, uh, there is of course uh, pushback, you know, we don't like to talk about it because we want to talk about the good parts of our projects. but. Um, the key is actually starting very early in consultation with stakeholder groups, obviously, and letting them know that things are going to happen. Uh, the other key is sort of alludes to what I said earlier about uh, niche services and really taking a very granular look at your audience. It's very important, I think, with most projects to not make it look like it is some extremely large, all-encompassing, homogeneous projects. Um, given subsets of faculty do not want to be all treated like each other and so making it look like you're doing a project that is all one big thing for everybody is very difficult and it's if one starts early enough and with a lot of consultation really focusing on how a particular project is going to focus on benefiting a particular segment of the community and not making it sound like you're just wholesale implementing something uh, and that everybody is being uh, tarred with the same brush. We, one doesn't want it to look uh, like that. Um, in terms of what Chris was talking about, um, process review, um, it, it may be sort of a, um, a jargon problem with you know different countries. It took me a little while to understand what you meant exactly. And I realized, of course, you were talking about sort of workflow management and adjacencies. And um, I didn't really go into a lot of detail about our space plan, but I will explain now when I talk about data, in a, in a long-term space plan, you're not actually designing a project. So the data are probably more important than any of the actual design elements. You're trying to project, in our case, over 20 years, what is going to be needed. So you're looking at um, a lot of workflow. How is it likely to change? How many people are going to be in this department? Is this other department going to shrink? What are the likely uh, collection growth rates at a very detailed level, particular types of collection materials, growth rates, particular types of services, workflow adjacency, and of course you don't really know, so you have to kind of take some best guesses. Um, cost estimating and phasing, uh, how much is this going to cost if we have to spread it out over 10 years? The problem I alluded to at the very end where if your politics, your data, or your funding fall apart, you, it's very time intensive and it can take you a year or two to collect this kind of information as part of a space plan. And then if you wait, have to wait five or six years to get funding to come together, suddenly the president says to you, well, your data's all out of date and everything's changed, so you have to go redo that. Um, so it's, it's very difficult and yet it's critical to have a look at these adjacencies and, and, um, and keep this kind of information up to date once you have a plan. I'll just add quickly about social media. I think it, you're absolutely correct, Lorelei. It's very um, exciting and creative. I'll add a few things. Just literally the day before coming to this conference, we were having a significant discussion in our management team about contracting with Google Street View to do um, maps but on the inside of our library. And the campus has not previously authorized any buildings to be done um, with interiors. And so we're looking at, is there a security risk? Is there a public relations risk? Um, but can we do Google Street View? Uh, also, I've seen wonderful things on some campuses 
with uh, geo-referenced background links if people are looking at <coughs> maps uh, uh, or even Wikipedia, having um, geo-referenced or <coughs> contextually specific uh, links come up in real time um, with background information provided from the library. Those make, uh, by the way, great summer projects for student interns in the archives. Um, <coughs> so I, I think we've only seen the tip of the iceberg with uh, social social media, you're you're correct. It's kind of time intensive, so I think people are still in a very experimental mode with that. I'd like to add one comment. I think um, engaging the <coughs> students and the faculty in um, environmental scans and understanding their needs. I think what's important is making sure those are your minimum ba benchmarks, and that your staff and that you, that you have insight and that you can take it one step further. And, and you, that way you meet the needs of your students, but then also push it. Use your creativity, use your knowledge of, of, of your camp. What's really important is knowing your campus and taking it a step further, being creative. And then I think I agree with Sarah that um, in that process of taking it a step further, um, create those niche, those niche partnerships and create new opportunities and where your campus is unique and special and really enhance that. And the library being so central is a wonderful opportunity to take that. So there's, there's one thing I wanted to add was, is you know, doing those environmental scans but making sure those are your minimum benchmarks and push it a bit further. I just wanted to add just a quick follow on. Um, I think Chris and, and Simon's point and, and Sarah's point about that uh, operational um, and the workflow and the process review is critically important. Um, it, we see so many requests for proposals, requests for qualifications, where you're supposed to talk about your green building. Um, we always talk about operational sustainability, workflow, um, the operational costs over the life of the building will dwarf the capital cost. And so put that into your, uh, as you're searching for your design team, make sure you include that because they, if you found the right design team, they can bring a lot to that dialogue um, just for the work they've done. <coughs> Good morning. My name is Tanner Ray, and I'm with the University of Maryland Libraries. We have just completed an architectural design project for renovation with a huge component of participatory design, including students, faculty, our staff, and four courses. I'm interested in hearing from the panel about any work you've done where you trust the users and bring user input into your processes. The one. Uh uh, we did some of that on a fairly small scale project, the project that was flashing up on the screens earlier this morning that looked like a whole lot of glass and furniture. This was the main floor of a three-story library, so the books are all crushed into the third floor and first floor. And the second floor is now almost entirely um, collaboration, uh, group study rooms, and re rearrangeable furniture, very similar uh, to what's been um, done up at Calgary. And we brought students in as part of the planning committee. Originally, several years ago, it had been a student proposal from an engineering class to do this kind of space. At the time, we didn't have the funding. Um, we wanted to keep it under control, so I have to admit we didn't give uh, the students free reign, um, but we kind of sketched out some general parameters, and then we talked about you know, what are the sizes of groups that you like to work in? Uh, we brought in, um, as you talked about furniture, we brought in furniture uh, and everybody sat in it, not only the students, but you know, the staff and deans and um, expressed, um, you know, what kind of look uh, did we want and would they use uh, tables or laptops in, in certain locations? And so this was very successful. It wasn't as venturesome as some of the processes I've seen that really from scratch um, bring in almost the anthropological research approach about um, how do you use space. But uh, I think it, it does help if you can really focus. Students don't have a lot of time and sometimes these projects, the plans stretch over two academic years and then you have different set of students. So it's um, a really good thing to do if you have a project where you can get the timing to happen over the course of a given academic year so you have some continuity so you can educate the students a little bit about what the challenges are in a given project what is on or off the table <clears throat> and then within a sort of a defined concept um, have a lot of freewheeling uh, brainstorming. Calgary we had um 
I would say two specific initiatives. I think the first one um, would be for that uh, visualization studio that I talked about that was designed for faculty and mostly by faculty and that we were sort of uh, facilitated that process. And I think that was very successful and I think really does um, help with buy-in as well. Um, the second one was actually with the student furniture. We actually found our students were uh, a little too conservative, and I didn't. We didn't really believe them, and they said, "Just make sure we've got carols, and that's enough." I was like, no, I, I think you'll like more, and uh, and so what we did was we 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 did. We went ahead and we pushed the boundaries, and we opened the building, and uh, I I fought really hard for bean bags. I heard such wonderful success, especially in Australia, and sure enough, our bean bags were loved to death. Literally, a month and a half, they were turned to dust. Um, and the student groups we had engaged originally um, said something like that was completely ridiculous. But their colleagues apparently disagreed and used them. And so now I have found the bean bags that Australia uses that has uh, outdoor fabric, so it's wipeable and they can be recharged and refilled easily. And so. And they also have a bit of a frame so the bean bags don't lie down like mattresses, which undergrads at that special time of their life like to do. Um, so again, it's, it's listening to your students, but then pushing it further. Um, what we also did is after the building opened and the students did see what was possible and experienced it, we did put together a student advisory committee and they certainly advised us on their opinions on the furniture. And you know, with this building, as, as everyone has mentioned, no matter what the interior designers tell you, the lifespan of a furniture piece is, you know you're gonna be buying furniture every two years. And, um, and, and so the students are providing great direction on, on the furniture. Uh, we've actually changed our standard study carol in response to the students. A uh, little bit higher walls, uh, opaque but transparent walls, uh, keeping electrical outlets, and we actually have security loops, and they're just starting to figure out what those are, so you can use a Kensington lock with their mobile technologies. So um, hopefully that helps. And so uh, I'd just like to add for the participation, I think it's very important at the start of the project to make a participation plan, understand who you want input from, what type of information, when you need it. That's very, very important. Um, if you don't want to pay the design team to redesign things because some great new input late in the process, you need to get that at the right stage. But you also need to have the design developed at a certain stage to ask the right question. So have a plan, know what you expect from each group, try, uh, discuss how you're going to reach out to them. There's different modes for different groups. Um, and I think your obligation really is to listen to everyone, but as Sean has said, at the end of the day, you're still the leader of the project. Um, listen to them, um, consider it, and then make your decision. So listen to everybody, but don't take everyone's opinion. Can I, I just jump in quickly with a comment that follows up on the earlier social media comment too. And I can remember a time when I started in libraries and it was very hard to get student feedback and to do surveys and all that kind of stuff, you know, our, our response rates were always pretty dismal. And yet, you know, when you mine the, the social media uh, stuff out there, uh, it's incredible. It's like a focus group on the library <laughs> every day. And, you know, even if you're planning and thinking uh, in your design plan uh, phase, uh, look at what students say about your current space and what they like and they don't like. Uh, we'll give you very, very rich information. And we're always, uh, we have a communications group in the library and they're always monitoring the um, various, you know, different, different outlets for student discussion. And it's amazing how much feedback they give to each other. And, and, mm -hmm. and sometimes when you're not listening, uh, they're, they're most frank and honest, uh, both very positive, but also the negative stuff. And so um, I encourage everybody to, I mean, we have, you know, it's like your survey's going on every day. Uh, jump in the conversation, listen and, and lurk a bit, and you learn a credible amount of what, what students both are looking for and hoping for, as well as like uh, and don't like about what you've done. So just remind everyone to do that. I think just to add to that, we, we find that some of our students are actually policing each other using yes. social media. So, yeah. um, you know, they, they get annoyed about noise yeah. in the library and then they tell each other, well, it's you that's being noisy. So, um, and sort of. And, and of course, the, uh, the, the other stuff about I saw you. <laughs> We're often the hub of uh, for <laughs> starting romances and flirtations. <laughs> it's always interesting to see what 
happening there too. Well, and uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to say this, but since you opened the topic, um, two different libraries I have worked at have been voted by you know the student annual poll in the newspaper best place to have sex on campus. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure that uh, many, many uh, of your libraries also, uh, and I don't know whether to think of this as student engagement or what, uh, but um, I think it actually is simply how students see an enormous um, uh, uh, seeming contradiction between an academic center and a social center, but it in fact exemplifies um, how we, you know, how we would like uh, those concepts uh, to interact on campus. So, uh, collegiality and academics. Jackie Dooley, OCLC Research. Lorelai, you called for folks to comment on. Um, circumstances where uh, people have not necessarily been receptive to change. And um, I'm going to um, toss that right back at you by telling part of the story at Irvine that you didn't tell. And I hope you don't mind me outing you on this, but um, my, my source at UCI tells me that, at least in part, um, this uh, external use of library space was imposed on the library as opposed to you going out and looking for um, tenants for the, you know, a floor of the science library, and that um, you turned that into such a positive thing um, that it's brought great capital to both the library and to you in the process, as opposed to something where you stuck in your, you know, dug in your heels and said, you can't have my space. <laughs> so referring back to Sarah's um, talk about leadership and politics, I thought that was a very sort of almost revelatory example of how you can make a silk purse. Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> so, congratulations on that. I, I, will, I will say that, in a way, you're right. It's making. Uh, uh, lemonade out of lemons and uh, and looking at these opportunities for and milking it and leveraging it in the way that that Sarah mentioned um, I won't say that it was necessarily forced upon us I think it was some choices here uh, one of the things that I, I do need to share is that because of the uh, the very challenging budget situation in California the UC system and, and at our particular campus um, there were a number of task forces formed on a whole range of issues, you know, graduate students, graduate ed education, undergraduate education, and a task force on the libraries as well. So all of this was driven by budget in terms of where can we um, save money for the campus in all the different areas possible. And the task force was composed of, of administrators, students, faculty, um, and library folks. And what, what, what came out of that report um, was a good thing. It was that the library services and resources are so key and instrumental to the success of the campus that we couldn't find a place to cut it other than sharing space. And so what this allowed the campus to do was to be able to um, stop paying some very expensive off-campus leases and bring back folks like our um, Office of um, Information Technology programmers back to campus and sharing that space and leveraging it that way. And so, yes, you know, in a way you could say that it was forced on us, but it was also really us on the team, the libraries included, who made that choice of saying, look, we need to preserve the other aspects, the services that we've been talking about and the resources, and that the sharing of space can actually work to our advantage. So thanks, Jackie, for bringing that up. Online question. Mm -hmm. We have another question submitted um, online from Catherine Friedman at UC San Diego. How do you plan and budget for furniture and technology renewal or replacement? Um, well, those are, I, was, I will say, at least in places I've worked, um, both in public and private institutions, those often are two quite different categories of money. So, um, uh, for example, um, one of, if, if you're not actually doing a new renovation project where it might have its own initial furniture budget, if you're looking at ongoing replacement, it's a really great thing to do with um, if you have any end of year money 
that is non-recurring. So you might throw it at your monograph budget or you might buy chairs. Um, or hopefully both. Uh, chairs were a great thing to buy at the end of the year with bits of leftover money because they break all the time. Um, but, but it is often one-time money that you have uh, that you um, are, can do some modest um, replacement and it has to be very zoned. Uh, technology is much more difficult because you really have to ideally commit to a um, replacement cycle and uh, that's the kind of thing that you want to maybe try to negotiate with the campus and uh, depends on how technology, hardware, budgets are done differently on every campus. So uh, it, it's important to try to make that budget, but um, in, in my experience, it's done so differently even from two seemingly similar campuses that it's hard to generalize, but it, but it takes a combination of putting uh, some internal funds and negotiating some external uh, external, I mean, within the campus, integration of library hardware into other campus hardware um, budgets, but it can uh, it can be very stressful to try to commit if you want to say a four-year replacement cycle. Is that even doable? Yes or no? At um, at Calgary, I think the furniture we would we would echo um, technology actually. Um, Kristen Antelman at North Carolina State and I met a couple weeks ago and uh, her new library that's opening up in January um, is also very technologically aggressive and so we, we talk a lot and we keep in touch. And, and there's some technologies that we have purchased and that are very new. Um, you know, we have something, both of us have purchased Christie Digital Micro Tiles. They're like high resolution Lego blocks and you can build them up in strange and weird ways and have some fun showing digital um, space. Um, we really don't know how long they're going to last. And uh, of course the vendors have their you know, lamp hours, um, but the way we use them, who knows? And would we replace them with the same thing? I doubt it. Probably you know, two, three years down the road, they'll have something totally different. How do we budget for that? And does Moore's Law really kick in? And you know, do we plan for half the cost of what we originally paid? I don't know. The DJ mixing board, will I replace it with the same thing because students spill something on it? I don't know. And I don't know what the cost is going to be six months from now. Um, so I think with desktop computers, we can do those four or five year planning cycles. But some of these new technologies, it's tough. And we don't know how long they'll last. And we don't know what it's going to cost tomorrow. And uh, maybe what the students will want the next day after that. So absolutely, the budgeting is, is a huge question. And it's something that the few of us who are venturing into this strange area are just going to create a little support group and help each other out as best we can. I think it's. I think our our future I, I see is very much around the software and the niche technology because um, our saving grace I think collectively is that students and and users bring what they need uh, more and more now. So we certainly don't see uh, huge investments in a lot of physical uh, desktops as much as we used to. But now trying to find the niche software and the and the niche tools that people don't bring, and I think that is going to help us in the future. Uh, of letting go of feeling we have to provide everything. Um, a lot of it now comes with the user, which is, which is great. We're not finding that. <laughs> Hello, John Aubrey at the New School in New York. The plans have been drawn. The uh, superstructure is in place. We're about a year from moving in. We've been looking at our organizational structure, our processes. What is the main thing we should be thinking about right now? <laughs> Organize to meet what users will think of you, not what staff. Mm -hmm. Do not make the user figure out your internal organizational structure. Yeah. It, we, we, I just want to second that. We really see s staff sometimes holding back the thinking, and you need to be the leader that we talked about. <laughs> And, and also plan for success. And you know, I think almost all of us are, are after we've opened the doors, are victims of our own success because the the adoration of our spaces is overwhelming. And you know what? It yeah. might be a good idea to have some plans ahead of time. And we did, um, and I'm glad we did. Um, but it turned out we didn't have enough because uh, it was more successful than that. So uh, I would also recommend uh, staff uh, Gatorade and granola bars and <laughs> you know, supporting them with food. Uh, well, and you know, yeah. We found it helpful to hold back a little bit uh, of the furniture budget uh, so that when we opened, 
Um, we, some of the spaces that we didn't realize were going to be used in the way uh, that they were being used right off the bat, we had a little bit of money put aside. We were able to uh, then choose some furniture that actually fit. Uh, so if, if students were moving particular furniture into an area that we didn't you know, anticipate being used, we could then go back and, and quickly um, sort of uh, add that in. So if possible, um, it's a small thing, but if you can hold a little bit back on opening day, uh, it really is a big help to react to that we never thought of this moment kind of thing. Yeah. And possibly another one is implement a, a, a records management plan prior to leaving your, your old building. You may mm. find out that you don't need half as much storage space for staff files and things like that that, you, that your staff currently have in their, their offices. So if you actually undergo, I mean, there's a, a, a technique called 5S. It's part of the sort of lean Kaizen family of, of um, process reviews that, that you can actually do. Um, it, was, it was a lean Kaizen process that we did with our, um, uh, with our sort of acquisition to shelf project, uh, but the 5S, which includes sorting and, um, and basically chucking stuff out, but well, well, well before you, you move. I mean, do it now and then do it again before you, before you move um, and, and allow people to let go of stuff at that stage. I want to just thank the panel, thank uh, the presenters. It was terrific. I mean, and, and you could tell that uh, people would be happy to continue to have some uh, conversation about this because there's so much to unpack. Um, but we are going to have to pause because we stand between the end of the conference and lunch. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>